Hi, Jar here, and I am very, very excited to show you the text-only exclusive prototype preview of Spurb Sim 2, by which I mean the land of storytelling and sorcery, by which I mean the Lightland of Ragnarok. Um, as you may or may not know, the Lightland of Ragnarok stars a bard or scald of light who is definitely going to explain everything to you, don't worry. So one of the themes of this is, is obscuring through knowledge, and one of the best ways to do that, for example, Session 13 in Spurb Sim, is about as inaccurate as you can get. It goes differently, like, we do an update and something goes different, like, there is so much knowledge, so much data, that you can't actually know how things really go. And so the, the theme of the Lightland is going to be, okay, let's just show you what Fragnarok is. Smile, smile, smile. And um, you're going to end up more confused than when you started, is the hope. But you're also going to understand a lot of stuff and have a lot of fodder for theories and, and bullshit. And it's going to be great. I love it. But if we want to get that actually going, we obviously need a narrative engine. And I learned a lot making Spurb Sim, right? Like, like a lot, a lot. And one of the things I learned is that... No, it is bullshit. I don't want to code anymore. I love coding, but when I'm coding, all of the Wranglers are just sitting there, like, twiddling their thumbs. When it's data-driven, and toward the end, Spurb Sim became data-driven, that's what the AI engine was about, you end up having, I can work on making the framework better while other people are going behind me and actually filling in the content. And so that is what we have here. So you will see just a mind-boggling amount of tests, and this is just for the very early part. This is not Spurp Sim. This is not Ragnarok. This is a general purpose story engine. I'm going to show you what the test case looks like, and then I'm going to show you a little bit of what the code looks like. So like the end of the video is going to be more for the waste than anyone else. So what we have right here is we've got some arrows. So the very first way this is going to be different than Spurb Sim is instead of a big dumb pile of everything that's supposed to kind of look like a fan fiction, it's going to be closer to looking like like an uh, MS Paint Adventures kind of image, text, next page, image, text, next page is what we're going to kind of go as a, as a look and feel. So we're not going to crash browsers anymore from over, over memory usage. We're going to be able to lean heavily on graphics, music, um, mild animations, like there's going to be a lot going on, and yes, doll sim integration. Like you want to be a pigeon, you want to have a face, whatever, go wild. Spurb sim ended up being way too complicated to get refactored into the doll sim. This is just, let's nuke it and start over. So we start out, there's, there's some text, so what we're looking at is right here, at the very bottom in the orange, lighter orange. This is this is light themed. In a cryptographically relevant corner of the universe, Alice, having sent zero messages, sends a new secret message to Bob. She notes she has now sent one total message. Bob reads his message. Carol kind of sucks. Bob doesn't really react, thinks about the number 35.26, then clears his messages out. Then Alice, having sent one message, sends a new secret message she sent to. One thing I'd like to emphasize here, even if you're not very Cody, is you can tell, like, for one, there are numbers that are going up, like, Alice has a sense of memory. Two, obviously Lightland isn't about sending messages. This is completely arbitrary. We could do anything. Alice could, like, be delivering pizzas that have specific topics, or going on space adventures, or playing Spurb, or going to Hogwarts. Like, remember, one of the original end states for Spurb Sim was going to be... You know, you, you, it was meant to be more a, a concept of, hey, let's make procedural fanfic, and then everyone and their brother goes, well, what if Dave and Carcott went to prom, or attended Hogwarts, or were on the run in an intergalactic space opera? Like, changing the setting is one of the prerogatives of fanfic, and it's something we always wanted. Okay? So... We have another scene, there's another character called Eve. Eve is able to read Bob's memory banks. They're all kind of robots. 
So she detects that Bob has a memory, she reads it, and is scandalized, and she has like a scandal rating. Important thing is all of this is cached. Once a scene is created, we just can display it again. So that's going to really help speed. When we get to a scene we haven't seen before, like this is a new one, then it just renders it on the spot. Like it's not going to let you go further than it's rendered, but it's, it's blazing fast right now. And then at some point, the scenario realizes, like, this specific scenario knows, I start with the phrase, in a cryptographically relevant corner of the universe. And it knows I end with the phrase, now that Alice has sent five messages, the cycle of messages ends. And it only ends when Alice has sent those five messages. Like, if we were to go, yeah, she knows she has now sent five total. So it, it ends correctly. If this were a spurb scenario, we'd do something like, after 113 tickets, uh, ticks, and then we do something like detect frog level to decide which ending you get. The important thing is we can do so many dumb things with this. The plan is myself, Wranglers, and Wastes will have access to the full builder. If you've seen the AI Engines builder for Spurbsim, think that level of bullshit. Uh, probably a little bit, you know, better UI, a little less confusing, but but really in the guts, really in the details. You have to know how the engine works to use that. A layer above, we're going to have the ability to, like, we're going to have this concept of different scenarios. So here's, here's Spurb, that's a scenario. Here's Hogwarts, that's a scenario. Here's intergalactic space adventure. Here's high school. Here's Faragnarok. All of these different scenarios. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pile that onto a character creator. So your average person, they're going to start up, they're going to have access to one scenario. It's going to be Fragnarok. They're going to have access to a pile of characters and they just say, drag this character into the scenario. You know, start with these three, these five, whatever, hit start. As you play, you'll do things like, okay, now you can put those same characters in a new scenario. You know, what, what is Erikar and, and Zoe going to do in high school drama, or what have you? You'll also, as the game progresses, unlock the ability to customize characters. Like, well, what if they look different? What if they had a different name? We're going to have this concept of pre-packs. So you'll be able to drag and drop an entire set of characteristics, scenes, um, stats, what, uh, there's a concept of generators, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit later with the code section, but the generators are going to let us do things like say, here is the knight prepack. It has generators that control land name, consorts, quests, um, you know, plot arcs, etc. Here's the mind prepack. It's going to have generators that control all of that same stuff and the denizen. And when it comes time to generate the land for this character, the two generators are going to work together to generate a combination of night and mind. But remember, night isn't a concept of this, this engine. Mind isn't a concept of the engine. It's completely procedural. So if you were instead trying to generate a, a class list for a high school scenario, you could use the same system. And that is why I'm very excited. Because if you remember my reaction to Smokey the Bear, to, to the White King abdicating via just mailing his fucking scepter to the Black King, I love it when things go off the rails. I love it when things are unpredictable. And this is going to be the least predictable thing I have ever made. And I am very excited. So I'm going to stop this particular recording, start up a new one for the wastes, and I'll probably just stitch them together, whatever. See you soon. Hi, wastes. If you are listening to this, you had better be fairly comfortable with code, or at the very least willing to listen to me ramble about it for a little bit. Um, so what we have here is... So I don't have the builder yet. Like, I, this has all been a test run, so this is me directly in the code, testing everything is working. So you will see, like, this is the code. It's actually fairly simple, especially compared to Spurbsim. You don't see a goddamn single reference to Homestuck, to Spurb, to Knights, to Mine, to... All of this is basically... Like, you know how the land of Games and Confusion was essentially, let's rip out the alchemy engine from Spurbsim and make it stand alone in a new context? This is, let's rip out the AI engine from Spurbsim 
and do kind of the similar thing with a couple couple bit more extra special sauces. So the important thing for this is I'm defining a scenario here without defining any of the scenes on a character yet. I, I decided specifically for this test case I was going to do it in two steps because I thought that, that made things a little bit more sane for me in the testing stage. Well, what we have here, if you'll excuse me one second, uh, what we have here is this is essentially a scenario that is called... I think I just called it Alice messages Bob. So in cryptography, there's just a standard like there's Alice who is sending a message to Bob, but there's an eavesdropper called Eve, like you do. And I just turned that into a very simple, very quick test case because I guarantee you this was not designed with this test case in mind or spurbs. Like I want to make sure I could do anything. So I just picked something dumb and quick that was easy to test. So we have three characters, Alice, Bob, and Carol. You will notice that entities actually do have names this time. They don't have to, but it's only in spurbs and the things have no names, no faces, no gender. So if you want them to have names, go for it. Um, they're all going to spawn as active. In like a spurb sim kind of scenario, obviously they activate one at a time as they enter the session, but you don't have to. So like imagine a builder where you can say, do they spawn active? Yes, no. Or do they have conditions that activate them? I haven't I haven't actually done those conditions yet. I don't think I don't think I've tested them. I should add that next. Let's uh to do add a fourth character who can conditionally activate. Cool. So one thing, like the very first thing I do is I create generators for these characters. So a generator is my way of allowing randomness, but not exactly randomness into the sim. So if we go over to entity, we see that they have basically two kinds of memory, string and number. You can store an arbitrary amount of data into each character. So if you want them to know what's their land, what's their quests, what's their denizen's name, how many times have they seen a friend die, you just shove that into there and it's fine, don't worry about it. So the point of a generator is it has the same key. So this string generator is going to make something called secret message draft and it will store it to its owner's memory when it generates it. So the way the system works, we know Alice is sending Bob messages. So if she does it by, she's got this string generator on her that knows of three kinds of messages. Carol kind of actually sucks. I've never really liked Carol. And don't you think Carol's actually a ghost in disguise? You know, standard office gossip. And what happens is when Alice is ready to generate a message, she activates the, her generator for the secret message draft. If we go over to my unit tests, we see Alice is sending a message. The effect is that she is going to use a string generator. She's going to look for a generator called secret message draft. This is the default message. Like if she can't find a generator with that, because the important thing is generators can be added on the fly. You could have like 16 different generators for the same field or none of them. Like what if you're a homestuck character shoved in a high school setting? You might not have a generator for your class list, in which case there needs to be a default value. Um, Friska obviously just means apply to me and not my target. Uh, one interesting thing here is you can see this is the scripting language for it. This activates, this accesses the owner of this scene's number memory and looks for a field called that. I'm very pleased with how this turned out. But yeah, this scene is just, she generates a message, she copies her message from her secret message draft field to Bob's secret message field. She increments her own secret message count, and there are two filters attached to it. Basically, she's only going to activate this scene if she can find somebody who is named Bob, who doesn't have a secret message. I mean, really, really simple. So, like, she's only going to send it once per tick, like we saw before. And I'm just so smug about this. So Bob himself has has reactors as well, uh, generators, I mean. 
They control just his reaction. Uh, so it goes, oh, he's going to post a bear. He doesn't really react. Carol has more interesting reactions. Like, if you assign, like, her reaction generator is going to be, it's scandalized, or she reaches new heights of scandalized. And we could just, in theory, we could switch it out. Like, Bob could have Carol's generator and vice versa. If you really care about pronouns, you can have pronouns stored into their memory. They can remember their own pronouns. I don't care. Whatever. I'm not making any decisions about any of this. Uh, this is just testing the random number. Like, we saw before that Bob would, like, think about the number negative 87.01, and that's where that comes from. So the important thing is it's not just, oh, I can think about it, as we see with, um, with Alice over there. Because you can just generate a value and store it to your own memory. You could literally say, um, your attack value is 13. You know, you spawn with that. That's your initial value. Or your sanity level just dropped by negative four. Or, you know, you can do all of this stuff procedurally. I am... I'm very happy. Like, this is, this is all basically how the AI engine works. It's... Like, I've got... Just like the AI engine, you have things split into filters and effects. Filters control, like... This just says, hey only target somebody who has this particular memory thing filled in. Like, if you don't have a message, don't target. And so every single scene, if we go click on scene real quick, every single scene just has a list of things that control targeting, a list of things that happen after the scene hits. So a scene where you murder somebody would set, you know, it would have the effect of set dead true. It's got targets. It's this is going to be so good. But yeah, as, as I continue, like, my to-do pile right now is doll, doll stuff, basically. I want to, I want to get the dolls in mild animation. Like, there's all sorts of cool things. Like, we could even go so far as be like, okay, set your expression here. That's all stretch goals. We're going to see how actually, how hard is this? Like, like, what's the render load? What's actually going on? But... My, my expectation is for the entire engine to be done in a couple weeks, but then the builder is going to take a couple months. And then after that, I have no idea how long it's going to take to actually get the scenarios and everything, like all the data worked in. I'm going to have a lot more help with that than just me on my own, but that's going to be the interesting part. Um, really, that's it right now. Like, the code is as simple as I could get it. I should delete that. Um, well, that's me. I'm excited. Thank you for tuning in.